appreciate that. I've never been introduced as the guy who created stone silence in the, in the room. And she mentioned my four daughters, which is special. They're four teenage daughters. And um, I left them to come here. You know, when speakers, when speakers get up and they say, it's really great to be here, it sounds all fake and insincere. It's great to be here. <laughs> it's crazy back there. And I always say, I, I, and I get the talking sticks when I'm here. At home, I just do a lot of gracious listening. But um, we're going to do a lot of flip charting today because what I did at the BMA was stand up and cast aside the PowerPoint and talk about how to tell a story. As marketers who build stories and salespeople who tell your stories often, um, my mission in life is to make sure that your story not only gets heard but gets acted on. And, and what I want to do today is, is, is do that, a, a share of that speech. Anybody watch that online by any chance? Anybody watch that? I just want to see how much material I can repeat. <laughs> okay, so maybe four out of you. So that's good, that's good. Everything is fresh. Here's what I understand. How many of you actually have to present? At some point in your job, you have to present, and it's part of your living to make presentations. So that's a good share of you. The rest of you, anybody help create presentations for others who do make presentations? All right. So at some point or another, most of you, it looks like 90 plus percent of you, are involved in making a presentation, like I have today. I had 15 minutes at the BMA. I have 45 minutes today. So what you're going to get, you know, I just heard actually today in the news when I was working out, I heard that the interview has just released some of the extra footage. Like we needed to see extra footage of that. But in, in a way, you're going to see the extra footage today that I couldn't do in the 15 minutes that I had at the BMA. But here's how we opened. And, and this is important to me, and I think it's going to be important to you as, you're, as you present. I'm in the business of looking at neuroscience, social psychology, and behavioral economics behind decision making. In other words, what hidden forces shape how you and I and your customers and prospects make decisions. And it's a fascinating world as you apply it to marketing and sales. But one of the studies talked about how people engage and remember your presentations or content that they hear. And what the science said was that they remember a good share of what you say at the beginning, about 70%. And they remember almost a good share of, if not almost all, of what you say at the end. I'm not sure it's true, but it might be scientifically proven that the words in conclusion will bring you back to... <laughs> I'm not going to offer that as a technique today, that you just sort of spike it with, and in conclusion, just kidding. But then what happens is in the middle is, People remember very little of what's in the middle of your presentation. Now what they did is they sort of chopped this down so you could understand the timing and the spacing of this. You got about five, in, in about a 60 minute presentation, you got about five good minutes at the beginning, five good minutes at the end. I'm a mass comm major, but I can do the math. You have 50 minutes in the middle. When I look at this, and then I think about most presentations that I see from companies, when I look at your PowerPoint decks, your product part presentations, maybe your company presentations, and I say, what, is, what does the first five minutes consist of? I could pretty much, let me just try this on you. The first slide shows up, and it says, we've been in business since 1850. We have this many employees. We've got this much revenue. Next slide. Here's a map of all the places and locations where we can do business for you. Next slide, here's a chronology of the inventions, innovations, and acquisitions we've made over time and why we're special. Next slide, here's a slide of all the logos of all of our clients that we work with. <laughs> Next slide, here's our mission statement. The first five minutes sound a little bit like this. We've been in business for that many years. We have this many employees. We have this much revenue. We have these locations. We have these products and services. We have these inventions and innovations. We've got these customers. You spend the first five minutes wee wee weeing all over your presentation. <laughs> At a point where the customer is most keen and ready to hear something new, something special. In fact, in our research, what customers tell us is, I'm paraphrasing, but in essence what they say is, you've got five minutes to tell me something I don't already know about a problem or missed opportunity I maybe didn't even know I had. Because that would be valuable to me. 
The biggest concern I have when you show up isn't whether or not you can ask me a bunch of questions that everybody else asks me and I give you a bunch of answers that I already know. What really would be valuable to me is if you tell me something I didn't know, help me see something I didn't see, and make sure I'm not missing something. Executives and buyers are busier than ever and they, get, they can't network, they can't handle the volumes of information. The real opportunity for you is to take these first five minutes and literally tell them something they didn't already know about a problem or missed opportunity they didn't have. Because here's what happens when you go wee, wee, wee through the first part of the presentation. They go, oh, that sounds like everybody else that's here. And the customer lands in what I technically refer to as the hammock. Literally in our book, we call this the hammock effect. Your customer goes right to the hammock. At the moment, what happens then in your presentation? What comes up after the first five minutes? What do you put in there? What? Anybody? The why. The why. Why, right? I mean, the meat. The really, I mean, like, this is where you put the meat. This is where the good stuff is. This is, you feel like this is preliminaries to get to the meat. But the problem is, you put the meat in the middle. Now, which is most excellent for a hamburger, I will admit. But a meat in the middle of a presentation is, is when the customer is least ready, least receptive, and least retentive, and least able to recall, and least able to retell. Now, talk to me about what you do at the end. What does that sound like? Yeah. So in conclusion, so you got their attention. Good for you. So in conclusion, what do you do with the conclusion usually? Yeah, you summarize. Right? And, 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 and try to get them, and, and, and they're hearing some of this news for the first time, and it's all out of context because they don't actually recall it. But also what I see in a lot of meetings at the end is, are there any questions? Now, what happens when they ask you questions? Do they usually ask you questions that are like right in your wheelhouse? Or do they ask the ones that go off on this trail and off on that trail? They take you to places you didn't want to go because all your good stuff was right here, and this is where you wanted them to be. And they just start asking these questions. And we wrap it up, and the last thing that they recall is a bunch of disjointed questions and really rough, terribly sort of dis d diluted answers because this was spit polished and, and, and this was sort of, hey, this is what I got for you. And we then fail to actually really recap and bring them back to something that they could retell. The way I like to look at it is, this is what you want them to retell when they walk the halls after you've made a presentation, when somebody says, hey, what happened when they had the meeting with such and such company? They're going to first go, this is their go-to move. This is the stuff they're going to talk about. What did you give them that they could retell and walk the halls with? And what did you tell them here that would allow them you know, some, to talk about and remember something they didn't know before they met you? How did you make them smarter? And then how did you equip them to take that smartness to other people? So I would like to promote to you today a brand new organizational philosophy for your presentations moving forward so that you can tell better, more memorable, remarkable stories. The research here is called primacy and recency. And that's a lot of how life goes in terms of what people remember. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Tomorrow, I want you to make sure your presentation has a hot opening. Tell them something they didn't know about a problem or opportunity they didn't know they had. Disrupt, surprise, get them engaged. Keep them out of the hammock that way. That way you don't sound like everybody else. And you gotta think of what your hot close is. How are you gonna close hot in such a way that you're like, I gotta put this here because if they don't remember anything else, they're gonna tell this to everybody when they leave the room. Then you have to deliberately think about how to spike your presentation. Create engaging moments, interactive moments, that allow people to try on what you had to say. Because the longer you keep them at arm's length, the more they don't have to make any kind of decision. Get them to try it on. And what we're going to do today is practice my new method, hot, spiky, hot. So what I literally want you to do, heads up for a second and eyes up here, when you go in to make a presentation, I want it to be hot, spiky, and hot. <laughs> That's four daughters. That just, that, they bought these glasses for me, by the way, didn't I? <laughs> they, they, they keep it real, plus two of them have tattoos, so whatever is, I failed. <laughs>
age 18, they went, bam! I think they went like, like the day they turned 18, they had had the appointment set and they went down and got that done. But hot, spiky hot. I want your organizational theory and process and principles when you put a presentation together to be hot, spiky hot. And what I want to do today is really help you understand what that looks like and sounds like and feels like so you can build hot, spiky hot presentations moving forward. In the essence of, of, of truth here, uh, in the spirit of truth, we've gone about maybe five to seven minutes into the beginning of my presentation. I would like to tell you that, ladies and gentlemen, this is my hot opening. Thank you very much. <laughs> How do I know it's a hot? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for clapping. It's been, been waiting. Um, why, why, one of the things that, uh, that I understand about this as, as a hot opening is, it's like you, you know your presentations need to be better, but it's an abstract idea. Great presentations. It's complicated and abstract. And so what I've done is taking a very comp taken a complicated abstract idea, like great presentations, and given you a simple concrete visual to remember it by. I've seen some people drawing it out there. Lots of places, like yesterday, I had 750 salespeople from Thomson Reuters out there, and they had their phones up, and they had all this stuff up, and they were taking pictures of this, and I said, that's how I know it's a hot opening, because you can actually take this, and you can tell this story, because I know this is what's going to happen. Within 24 hours, I kid you not, and my voice is going to come back to you, within 24 hours, you're going to be hearing or seeing a presentation, and you're going to be like Twitter, tweeting, Hashtag, I am so in the hammock. <laughs> and, um, and if you say that out loud to someone, like, dude, your presentation, man, I was in the hammock. And, and that person goes, hammock? W what do you mean, hammock? What are you going to do? You're going to draw this, because you can. You can convert and transform people's thinking about their presentations with a few squiggly lines, a couple numbers, wrapped in a story. You will never not be able to think of the hammock anymore when you're looking at a presentation deck. It will ruin your life. When you start to put wee 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 in the front, you're going to be like, oh no, we're weeing. Yeah, so you're going to, this is going to stick with you. And my whole point about this is, and you're going to be able to do something about this. You're going to be able to take action. And all it is is squiggly lines, a couple numbers wrapped in a story. My point is, when you give a presentation, you want people to do something different. It's just not information transfer. You actually want them to make a decision. Now, they can choose to stay where they are or make the choice to change, but the story you tell isn't just to entertain. The story you tell is to persuade and cause somebody to do something different tomorrow than they were doing today. That's what we're in the business of marketing and salespeople. We're not trying to get you know, friends and likes. We're trying to get deals. And the idea here is asking someone to do something different requires that your story do the work. And I will tell you that a visual story is the way to get that done. And the rest of our time together is how we're going to deconstruct this and give you some really practical tips on how to make this happen. But as you can see, this does not require tremendous artistic skills. Although I'm thinking of getting a tattoo of the hammock somewhere on my body. <laughs> I will not be doing it, obviously. But the idea here is an average human being can tell a story like this, and an average human being can retell the story. Because this thing wins when somebody else has this and passes it on. That, the, the idea in B2B, or the numbers in B2B say that 5.4 people are required to make a B2B decision. But not everybody's going to be in that meeting room with you. How are you going to help your, your, uh, the people who are in the room actually do some of the lifting for you? And giving them simple, concrete, visual stories that they can retell because you made them smarter and they can pass that on is one way to do that. Now, here's what I could have done, folks. Let's admit it. I could have done this in PowerPoint. I could have done this in PowerPoint. And I'm guessing it might have looked something like uh, shameless plug. No. Um, <laughs> it might have looked something like this. And let's be honest. I mean, you're marketers. You would have done something a little more beautiful. But every day, like yesterday, I had 750 salespeople in front of me. This is the kind of stuff they would produce. And they would say they did a good job. Well, I used the corporate colors. <laughs> I only had three points. And I tightened up the word count. And there's the data. It's the same exact data that I gave you. I hit the high points of the story. 
I put together, you know, a telling sort of title and a, a subhead that asks a challenging question, and that would be my PowerPoint. How did you feel when that went up? Did anything sort of change even physiologically in you? I, I would dare say it did. There's something about engaging in that whiteboard process that gets people leaning in. And there's something about PowerPoint that gets people sitting back. Because there's an element in the PowerPoint of, well, now it's time to be entertained. It's showtime. And with the whiteboard, you're like, dude's working without a net. How's this going to happen? You know? <laughs> Here, you know, somebody produced this, and I'm just clicking. So I know what you're saying, though. You're saying, Tim, this is not accurate. We use images on all of our PowerPoints. Well, there you go. <laughs> Stock photography is wonderful, isn't it? It'd brighten everybody's day. We all go and we get a catalog and we're like, I got a pre slide on presentation research. Let's find someone presenting. And bam, you got a slide. Now, some people are like, oh, we've moved away from bullet points and stock photography. We've moved on to Zen presentations. Have you heard about Zen presentations out here in the East Coast? Because it's a California sort of thing. But there's a whole book on it. And the idea of Zen is using borrowed interest and metaphorical photography to tell your story and bleed it across the entire screen and just use a couple words. Zen, hmm. That's how we're going to communicate. So I thought, well, what if I told the same story using Zen? It would look something like this. And then everybody would be thinking about a corona instead of hearing my story. But that's Zen. I mean, Steve Jobs was famous for this. So what I decided to do, and this is where the rubber really hits the road, folks, I found a guy named Zach Tormala. He's a PhD out of Stanford University. He's a PhD in social psychology with an expertise in persuasion. And I asked him to design an experiment to test the PowerPoint conditions versus the, if you will, whiteboard style visual condition. And what we did is we tried to decide which picture is the superior way of doing this. Here's why this is really important. I need to give you one more visual before we do this. The reason we want to know which picture is superior is because of a set of academic research called the picture superiority effect. I don't know if anybody's heard this research. There are about 12 academic papers out there. And what the picture superiority effect says is, if you have a conversation with a customer or prospect or someone you're trying to convince, they will remember all of 10% of that two days after you're done. And what the research was able to prove is if you anchor that concept or content that you're talking about in a simple visual, their recollection and ability to retell that story will go up to 65%, almost a 7x improvement two days later. It's called the picture superiority effect. So look that up. But that's the gist of it right there. So then my question was, all right, if the picture superiority effect is real, and you're going to remember what I have to say two days from now, seven times more if I anchor them in simple pictures, which picture is superior? Because all of these are visual. In a way, the PowerPoint is a visual channel or format. So which of these is superior? So what he did is he created a test. He wanted it to be a very conservative test. So what he did is have me create one voiceover talking about the research and what it means. And we cut and paste the research and, and created little videos of each of these formats. And we used the same exact audio on all three. You following me so far? So only the visual changed. But we didn't have me standing up and delivering. We just had these animating on screen. So what the person watched was bullet points come up, or they watched the hammock being drawn, or they watched a, a hammock, and um, listened to the audio. I, I probably cut it down to like two and a half minutes so it wasn't too overwhelming. Then he found 700 people screened by age and gender relative to the B2B buyer mix. And he put, divided them by three. And they only got to watch one of these. And then he tested them. And he tested them on six different things, many times asking three different questions, all having them rate. And I'll, I'll walk you through the results. So there was the, we called it the whiteboard condition the PowerPoint condition and the Zen condition. And here's what happened. He found out that in every category he measured, the simple concrete whiteboard style visual, in this case the hammock, significantly, statistically significantly outperformed 
all the other visuals. Now what's interesting about that is he called me all excited because he deals in statistical significance that's usually like 0.2 something or other. This was like 15 percentage points so on the other side of the decimal. So he's like, we never get to talk about stuff that like is this obvious. I was hoping for like 5x, but I'll take it. If he said, if he said that was statistically significant, I'll go with it. But to, in his mind, this was like a whitewash that the whiteboard style won on every level. So what we did is we tested them right after they watched it, and we went back and tested them two days later. In the area of recall, we literally put a box there, and they had to write out what they remembered, and we tested how much they remembered and how accurately they remembered it. They remembered way more, more accurately, after watching the whiteboard visual versus listening to the same spiel watching the others. We then tested engagement. They had in three questions to rank how interesting it was, scale one to five, how, um, how, how much more they maybe thought about the content, scale one to five. And in every one of those questions, and in the engagement test, whiteboards outperformed PowerPoint. This is my favorite, credibility. We asked them to rate the credibility of the speaker. I was the same speaker and it was the exact same audio, but I'm apparently more credible when you're watching a hand-drawn image than I am with bullet points in Zen. And my content was determined to be more expert and more credible or trustworthy in that condition. And I sometimes get this pushback where I'm like, I'm not gonna talk to an executive and, and, and do squiggly lines. I have to be polished, I have to be. And at the end of the day, what we're finding out is you're apparently perceived as more credible when you draw the picture as opposed to click it. Why might that be? This is called a spiking moment. Why might that be? Anybody know what he determined? It's yours, you own it. They trust you because you're telling the story, you own it, and you're the one who it's coming from. They don't even know that this was prepared by somebody else, potentially. You're delivering it in such a way that you own the content. You don't necessarily own it when you have a clicker in your hand. You're just kind of a jockey at that point, right? The PowerPoint or the horse is driving, you're just sort of along for the ride. When you draw it, you're more credible because you own the story, absolutely. Quality, three questions about clarity and compelling, whiteboards, higher quality perception. Higher quality perception, that's ironic for all of us PowerPoint studs. That was like my thing for many years. And, and, and then persuasion, were you more likely to follow what you heard? They were more likely to do something in the whiteboard condition. Then finally, at the end of two days, we asked them, have you changed the way you do your communications in any way, even in these two days? And again, the whiteboards outperformed the others, again, in that range. So I, the irony is I'm using PowerPoint right now, but I'm using PowerPoint to trash PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> so I kind of feel good about that. Because, you know, that, that's another spiking moment, that counterintuitive sort of thing. Well, wait, you're using PowerPoint to say PowerPoint sucks. What are you doing? So um, this is the last PowerPoint I'm going to show you. Because if this is all true, that's really the last you should see of that. So I apologize for any sight lines, but I want you to gather in closer if you have to. The rest of our conversation is going to happen on the flip chart. Because by golly, it's more credible. I'm more credible. You're more persuadable more recallable, more clear, even when you draw like I draw. Do you have any questions about that? Because I've got a whole bunch more behind that. Um, I'll, I'll share this one, then, and, and you can maybe ask a question. But, so, the, so he thought, the experimenter thought, if we would have done this live with a person doing it on the whiteboard versus clicking, those numbers would be even wider. And so I asked him, why do you think this result is? And he does a ton of research in what he calls certainty and uncertainty. And in decision making, we all as human beings want to get to certainty. We hate living in uncertainty. And so what we do is we try to push things into certainty as fast as possible. One of our techniques is called heuristics. We see something that's a little complicated, and what we try to do is simplify it and boil it down to such a way where we're like, oh, that's like this other thing I've done. And so we're always trying to simplify stuff so we don't have to live in this uncertainty like, I don't know what to do with this. I need to resolve that. And he said what happens is, though, in PowerPoint, when you throw those bullet points up there, they are already certain of what you're going to say before you even say it. Because the desire to resolve to certainty is human nature. And they go right to the bottom, and they don't hear anything you had to say because they netted it out already. And so you could say all the good stuff between those bullet points, 
and they didn't hear it because they already netted out what you were going to say. So at a minimum, if you do PowerPoint, use build, use animation, make the bullets come up as you tell the story because you, you don't want them to resolve to certainty. In fact, if you want to persuade someone, you actually have to cause them to be uncertain first because uncertainty opens them up to persuasion. Why? Because if they're uncertain, they're seeking a resolution to that. They're seeking certainty. So the first step in telling a great story and doing it visually is that you must introduce uncertainty. So what did I do here in this picture to introduce uncertainty? I walked through a typical PowerPoint deck and I allowed you to think about the ones you have, the ones you've done, and the ones you know. And I, I, I basically was able to portray for you more than likely that you are putting people in the hammock. Now, have I seen any of your PowerPoint decks? Did I tell any of you, you suck? <laughs> I didn't, not for a moment. I just shared a story. I provided a little bit of insight. You did, another thing that Zach Tormala says is really important, you self-persuaded. That's the most powerful form of persuasion, is you create a context for someone that's going to create some uncertainty because you didn't know these stats before and you're wondering what I'm talking about and where it's going so you're getting a little uncertain and then you start then I walk you through the example in your and it, out loud and you're putting it into your head and you're starting to go oh my stuff my, I might be putting people in the hammock you self persuaded I just had to create that environment so uncertainty is the first job of a visual and then resolving to certainty is the second job and so what I want to teach you are, are two concepts and show you by example how every visual, first you got to do a visual, second it should be simple and concrete, not abstract and complicated, and then third it should have these two components. So I'm going to tell you what they are and then the rest of our time together we're going to talk through them. It needs context to that, that uh, creates urgency. You need to put it in a context or a framework to first create urgency, or in other words, put them into uncertainty. Then you need to share contrast in order to demonstrate value. In other words, resolve to certainty. Real quick, I'll go back and then I'll teach you each of these. Context that created urgency was introduce the concept, told you why it doesn't work, ask you to think about what you're doing, and the majority of people do this. So there was a little bit of uncertainty and now a little bit of risk established. And so now I created a context. The environment around you was a little disconcerting. And then I sought to resolve it with a new approach and create some contrast right here for you, literally and visually create some contrast to compare the current state versus the recommended state. And you can decide the value of making that change. This may look like a simple picture, but there's a lot going on in there. But it's really two simple things, context and contrast. And I want to kind of dig deeper on those real quickly to teach you each of those so that you can, even if you're doing visuals in PowerPoint, I would tell you, make them dynamic and make them simple. Because here's why. The idea of context for urgency and simplicity comes from the neuroscience that I've been studying. Some of you may have heard of this if you're at all a Seth Godin fan. That's the that's a person. That's <laughs> now you know it is because that's the brain. Um, <laughs> Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, <laughs> the neuroscience people have, since they've been able to put functional MRI out there, they've been able to study the parts of the brain involved in decision making. And what they've been able to see is that if you ask someone to analyze something, this part of the brain lights up. It's sometimes referred to as the new brain, the neocortex, the supercomputer, the analytical part of the brain. But when you ask someone to actually take a decision, to make a choice and do something, a whole different part of the brain lights up. Some of you may know it as, Seth Godin calls it the lizard brain. The, the technical term is the amygdala, emotional, intuitive, rational, logical. But the part of the brain that makes the decision to do something If other words to actually change, right? This is the current state. I need to do something different, move to a different state. The decision to actually make a change, which is what we're doing as marketers and salespeople, convincing people to change, takes place right here. 
And what happens here is validation and justification. What we hear from, when you look at the decision maker, so the decision to change happens here, and then the validation or the justification happens here. What happens, though, is we're misled often by our customer research. Because we ask our customers, what will it take for you to change? And they tell us. But they're lying. They're actually lying to us. Why? Because the capacity for language exists here. There's no language here. So when you ask someone what's going to take for you to change, they'll tell you what they really told you is, this is how I might validate this. But you haven't convinced them to leave their status quo bias yet. The behavioral economists have come up with the phrase status quo bias, that everyone lives in status quo bias. You are not selling to convince someone to leave a competitor. You're convincing them to do something different, leave their status quo. And that is not a sales job. That is change management. Selling and marketing is change management. It is not selling and marketing. Because all day long, you're trying to convince somebody who's good and solid in their status quo that their status quo is starting to leak and it's starting to squeak. And it's not starting to leak and squeak because you have a new product, right? We like to create urgency by launching a new product. And we go, it has the ABC 6000, but this year we added Turbo Durflex technology. And the person's supposed to be like, oh, I've been waiting for Turbo Durflex technology. <laughs> Sign me up. Our urgency is not their urgency because the status quo bias is so solid because changing to that looks hard and risky and the problems I have today, if you ask them, what problems are you having today? The customer will tell you. And then you come in and say, we can solve those problems. And then they'll look at you and say, no, thank you, I'm fine. And you're like, what? You just told me you had problems. And they'll be like, yes, I've got problems. But because I could articulate to those to you, I am not dead yet. That project that you call a solution, I call change management. My problems are problems. I'm not dead yet. This project could kill me. <laughs> if you say, I've got to get into the head of my customers, that's what you've got to get into the head of. We're all thinking, we've got to get into the head of our customers by persona. What's their role? What's their responsibilities? I want you to go to a deeper level where the customer, who's still a human being and has a brain that makes decisions shaped by hidden forces, is going, if I don't have to change, I don't want to change. I've got some problems, but the duct tape will work because this project could kill me. And the whole time, what you're battling against is, how do you help them see that their status quo is no longer safe so that now you have a solution? Way easier to make that decision than to make that decision. You with me on that? So what has to happen is you have to consider where that first decision to change takes place. And it's the emotional, intuitive part that wants to stay safe. The entire job of this part of the brain, this is analyzing, this is survival. And not, you know, we don't not know this. This isn't like new to you, but you didn't realize how powerful it is until you understand the now the social psychology research that goes behind this. So now you have the neuroscience. For 30 years, a Nobel Prize winning economist who's actually a social psychologist by the name of Daniel Kahneman. Any fans here? I didn't know. Didn't think so. His books are boring. Um, this is, this is why it's important for guys like me to draw simple pictures out of Daniel Kahneman's work. Um, <laughs> as uh, I don't come up with the research, I just popularize them. Um, he came up with a concept called prospect theory. If you look up prospect theory, you will see it contains two components. One is called loss aversion, and the other is called risk seeking. And essentially what's happening here in loss aversion he was able to prove over dozens of studies that have been corroborated by other researchers that people are two to three times, two to three times more motivated to do something different, make a change, to avert or avoid loss than they are to go after gain. Yet think about what we've been taught in marketing, value propositions, feature benefits. We bring good things to life. This is interesting if you think about the hidden forces that shape actual framing of value and decisions. We are two to three times more motivated to change what we're doing, leave status quo bias, to avoid a potential loss coming at us than to go after some sort of gain. Yet all day long, the first thing we promote is the potential gain and upside. And what happens is people don't make a decision to leave their status quo 
even though that's as impressive as it is, because the risk of making that change means that that's not a guarantee. But if a loss is coming at me, and changing in my environment, and changes in my competitive situation, and changes in my regulatory situation, these are things I can't get out of the way of. So the question is, will my status quo allow me to resolve those risks or not? And your job is to help them see, while this was a great decision when you made it, these things are coming at you, and they're bigger, and they're badder than you thought. Not because I have a new product you need to change, but because you're just not going to be able to respond to these things the way you need to. That's a whole shift. The whole idea is the emerging challenges coming their way will lead them to you as opposed to you leading with your stuff and hoping to get it. And that's all driven by prospect theory loss aversion and the neuroscience behind decision making. What is risk seeking? Risk seeking says when you want someone to change, it's risky and most people are risk averse. So you would have expected me to write risk aversion here. But the truth is, he wanted to find out when will people actually seek out, proactively seek out risk. When are we really willing to take some risk and go somewhere uh, and do something different as opposed to avoid it? And what he found out is we are more likely to seek out risk to mitigate loss as opposed to seek risk to get gain. And I would like to prove that to you right now in a spiky moment. If I was to drive a Brinks truck up right now and give you $75,000 or tell you there is another option, you could get $100,000, but there's an 80% chance. Kind of like, you know, new products. Hey, we got a potential upside here if you go with us, but your results may vary. <laughs> there's a 20% chance you're going to get nothing. All right, so I'm going to give you 75,000, or I might give you 100, I'm going to, there's an 80% chance I give you 100,000, 20% chance you get nothing. Who takes the guaranteed 75,000? Be honest, raise your hands. Yeah, see, this is why we aren't in Vegas. Um, um, at least 80% of you in the room said you would rather take the 75,000. The rest of you said, I'm willing to take a risk for maybe a little bit of upside. This is about 30 plus percent. And even if you average it out at 80%, that's $80,000. So that's potentially you know, 7.5%, which you can't get anywhere anymore right now. So this is a pretty interesting upside or gain, yet the majority of you chose this. So I'm here to tell you, you did not seek gain and weren't willing to take a risk to get gain. You sought to avoid the potential loss of getting nothing. That was a loss aversion decision, not a gain attainment decision. And the way I'm going to prove it is by flipping this on you, literally. Now, what if I told you you're going to lose 75,000? I'm going to take it from you, or I'm going to give you an option, an 80% shot that I'm going to take 100,000 from you, but a 20% chance that I won't take anything. In the words of Jim Carrey, you're saying I have a chance. <laughs> now, how many of you take the guaranteed loss of 75,000? That's great. Like all of a sudden you've become riverboat gamblers. <laughs> Ooh, make it rain. <laughs> Look at me. Everybody in the room says, I am willing to take an 80% chance at losing 30 plus percent more just on the off possibility that I might lose nothing. Total loss aversion, total risk seeking. You sought the risk to avoid a loss, not to get a gain. This is human nature, folks, and that's who we're marketing and selling to. And business to business is still selling to humans, not to robots. If you're in a consumer business, some of this might be more familiar. But I feel like people who've gone into B2B think that our buyers have checked their real brain at the door. And they've inserted a computer. And they may tell you that, and they may sound like that, but I'm warning you they're lying to you. Because they cannot express from where their decision to change really comes from. They can only express how they will validate that. So even when we build our messages, based on the things our customers have told us in Voice of the Customer Research, we actually might be going down the wrong path towards a commoditized, non-motivating conversation. You have to surprise them. You have to tell them something they didn't know about a problem or opportunity they didn't know they had. That's why you have to create context. Context creates urgency. Without context, your products cannot create motivation. In fact, I live in Wisconsin. Go Packers. 
Um, I grew up 30 minutes south of Lambeau Field, so I got cred. In Wisconsin, we have this little thing in my subdivision called a tornado siren. And what I've discovered is on sunny days, if that thing goes off, and it goes off every Saturday at noon, everybody ignores it. We euphemistically refer to it as the noon whistle. Yet, if it becomes a cloudy day, right? Clouds roll in, and that whistle goes off, what happens? It literally becomes invaluable. And I thought to myself, you know that tornado siren performs, that product, the tornado siren, performs the exact same way in both circumstances. The decibel level, the tensile strength, all the features and benefits and specs and requirements of that tornado siren. But on one day it's ignored and on the other day it's invaluable. The only way your product makes, becomes invaluable is by putting it in the right context, the right environment. The context and in the environment where they see it as a solution as opposed to just a nuisance and a noise and a change management project. Think context for urgency. Understand that loss aversion and, and the ability or desire to seek the risk of change is motivated by loss aversion. And now you've got one half of the story and why you understand why I told this first by explaining the hammock and helping you see and compare and contrast yourself to the status of the hammock. The idea was to create a little bit of urgency, create a context for you to make that decision on whether you're OK or not, safe or unsafe. The old brain, not only does it not have the capacity for language, it also deals very simply. It's an on-off switch. It's very fast. And as a result, what it does is it takes into account what I said earlier, contrast. It needs the old brain to make a decision, craves contrast. In the absence of contrast, the old brain has a hard time making a decision because it's making a decision very quickly. Am I safe or unsafe? If it senses that it's unsafe, it is looking for a resolving new safe. Remember, uncertainty, certainty, safe, unsafe. Just keep those replaying in your head. That, our brain is doing that all day long, thousands of times a day. Am I safe or unsafe? And if I'm unsafe, I'm seeking a new safe. But I need to seek a new safe on two conditions. The new safe must resolve and fix the things that made me feel unsafe. And the new safe mustn't be too big of a stretch that I'm afraid I won't make it. So it's making a contrast decision. I'm here and I'm struggling. And if the thing you're proposing to me is like right about here, that risk of change might be hard. Maybe if I just hunker down far enough, I'll survive. If it's right here and it resolves the things that I'm dealing with and looks like a doable change on my watch, we can do that. If it's way over there in the George Jetson future, I might not be able to make that leap, so I'll hunker down again. Contrast is a nuanced thing, but contrast is very important. And what I need to tell you is that for, for someone to make a decision, they have to clearly see their current state literally see it, right, because they don't have the capacity for language. Contrast is an inherently visual concept. See their current state and then be able to compare that to the future state. And I will tell you that you do not have a value proposition until you do this because value is a perception and it lies in the contrast. If I can't compare a decision to anything, either like or something I've done before, I have a hard time making a decision. You have a hard time making a decision. Whether you know it or not, you frame every decision you make in some form of comparative or contrast. Whether it's directly with what you're choosing or some other decision you've made and you try to help yourself. So, well, I've never you know, bought something like this before and then somebody says, well, it's a little bit like this previous decision you made. Oh, well. I survived that. If it's like that, I can make that decision. Somebody had to create some contrast for you to make a decision. You got to help your customers by showing them that contrast. So I recommend that when you go in and show somebody the story that you, that you get them started, you want to show them their current state, you know, and show them that, you know, sort of got some issues and challenges with it. Help them see specifically what maybe some of the gaps or deficiencies or potential failure points are with the current state. So they begin to feel uncertain and a little bit unsafe about it. But it's not because you want to make them feel stupid. You want to tell them about all those things taking aim at their status quo. You want to make them feel smarter. The hammock was not designed to make you feel stupid. You feel smarter because of the hammock. Even if you put people in the hammock, tomorrow you're way smarter. I didn't make you feel stupid. This is the sort of the nuance to this. Show them the current state. Get them to try it on. 
And what most people push back on here is they're like, but only our customers can tell me what their problems are. Here's what customers tell me in the research that I do for the books. They say, you and your company actually see more people like me than I do. You meet with more people like me, you hear their problems, you solve for those problems, you're looking around the corner. I mean, your whole job is to figure this out for the marketplace. I'm here myopically, parochially focused on my own business and all the inner stuff, just trying to keep the wheels on the business. And when I raise my head off my desk for the meeting that I'm going to have, do I really want to hear somebody ask me the same 20 questions as everybody else did? And do I really want someone to wee-wee-wee all over themselves and look like everybody else? No, what I really want is, hey, you know stuff. You see people more of them like me than I do. So their phrase to me in some of the research was, you see more people who look like me than I do. So tell me something I didn't know about a problem or opportunity I didn't know I had. And, 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 and basically they say, you see more people look like me than I do, so act like it. That's what they're saying, act like it. So our company helps about, we are actively engaged with about 350 companies. I see about 150 PowerPoint decks from companies every year. So when I tell you those first five slides, I know those first five slides. Everybody's got those first five slides. You are one person working in your company on your slides. I am benefiting you today by telling you, if you're doing those first five slides, I know at least 150 other companies that have those first five slides. You might want to rethink that. So there's an element of, you trust me because I see a lot of things, and I am in all these companies, world-class companies, and I can express to you what's going on out there. And it isn't, again, it's, and, and, and so what happens is, in this state, you could, if we were like one-on-one -on -one in a room, and I tell you about some of the challenges and leaks, you might come up and say, you know, it's not exactly like that in our organization. Here's where we're at. And they start engaging your drawing. And the, the thing that it, it's different about that versus asking them what their problems are, you maybe tell them some things they didn't think of. Now you've created a dialogue as opposed to just telling them something they already know. If you do voice of the customer research, so has every one of your customer competitors. Who's not doing voice of the customer research anymore? And you come in and put your bullet points up and say, these are the industry issues that are affecting you today. And they're like, oh, newsflash. <laughs> and they're usually at such a high level. They're not the gotchas. These are my issues. But the thing that's going to kill me are the things underneath them that I have to fix in order to deal with that issue. So you want to introduce those challenges, threats, problems, missed opportunities, new requirements, and get them on board with that, and then show them how you are resolving those. Create a contrasting view so the person can start to understand this is the lay of their land. Because a lot of decision makers have made decisions that are on the shoulders of previous decisions, and their current state is actually unknown to them. Because it's been a series of decisions, it's like Frankenstein, series of decisions by multiple decision makers over time, blah, blah, blah. Now you come in and give them a view of that, like they couldn't have before, and you start dialoguing and, uh, and, and, and talking about that, and then you start to give them a picture of the future state. Now they can see value. Too many people go in today and they talk about the ABC 6000 with Turbo Durflex and talk about its features and benefits and say, here's our value proposition. You're like Mighty Mouse. You're walking in, here I come to save the day. And that person's like, yay. And, 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 and the reality is they, they look at your solution and they go, what? How's, what's people's most natural reaction to that? Yeah, I think I kind of do it that way. I'm pretty sure that's more or less how I do it here. Though, you know, seven of those eight things you talk about, I, I think that's how we do it today. So when you walk in there and just talk about your solution, they have a faulty presumption about how they're doing it today. They have no frame to compare what you're talking about until you express and expose and have a dialogue about how they're doing it today and make a clear connection because it is only in the contrast that they will see value. No contrast, no value. No context, no urgency. I got problems, but they haven't killed me yet. No contrast. No sense of value. Yeah, this would be worth the change. This would be worth the leap. So if you think about the simple little hammock that I drew at the beginning, and now understand everything I just told you about the hidden forces that shape decision making, you start to see why maybe this was as memorable and potent as I think it is. You will not forget the hammock, I guarantee you. But what was going on was context for urgency self-persuasion and uncertainty, resolve to some sort of certainty, create enough contrast for you to think about comparing this against the way you currently do it so that at least you can take some action. 
Value lies in the contrast and so does action. Once you show somebody a contrasting choice, I'm sorry, contrasting options, they must make a choice. And once they make it, that, I mean, you see what I'm saying? Either the choice is, I'll just keep doing it this way, I'm fine. Or the choice is, I think I might have to change. But as a marketing and salesperson, what you want people doing all day is just not friending you, just not liking you. You want them making choices and decisions, and you gotta guide them to that. So, I've got a hot close, <laughs> but I'm saving that for after the questions. So can I take a few questions? And then, as promised, we'll, we'll, we'll hot close this sucker. Yes? I don't have that research. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I'm doing a quarterly project with Zach Turmala. I'm going to make, put that on my list. Um, the next thing we're going to study is this concept that I don't have time to show you today uh, called unconsidered needs. The idea of um, introducing them to these ideas and needs and, and things they hadn't thought of. And so we're going to be testing four conditions where somebody, where it's, these are the problems I have, and, and, and in one condition, the answer just resolves those specific problems. The second condition is, these are the problems I have, and you give them the answer to those problems, and then you say, and we got all these value-added capabilities. And hint, the research says people don't perceive those as value-add. They perceive them as costly and complex. Uh, and then the third condition is, hey, before we answer that, let me tell you about a different way to look at what you're asking for and why you might want to think about this as well as this other thing. And we're going to test people's responses to different conditions. One that we hope wins is if you introduce and launch the unconsidered need, you will win the discussion more often than if you simply respond to the stated known needs. And you might even be able to charge more. So we're going to be testing this. So I'm going to write that down as something else to test. So my point of telling you that whole story is we are doing tests quarterly with this guy at Stanford now to start generating more unique exclusive research that we can share with the market. So stay tuned. Thank you. Good question. Yes? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it depends on when procurement shows up, right? If procurement's the first person you're talking to and you're trying to do all this to them, they're going to say, I went to school to ignore that. Uh, I mean, literally, there's something called like the American Association of Purchasing Agents, and they did a survey of them and asked them, how can, they, how can we sell value to you? And 98% said, you can't. And then they asked, well, how can we sell value to your company? And they said, if you get a line of business decision maker who has P&L responsibility to say, I really can't do my job well without this, it's very hard to unwind. So if you got 5.4 and you can bracket the procurement person with 4.4 others who believe that this is, they, they got to make this change because they're in deficit or unsafe, and they can then tell that story to the purchasing person, now it might be a matter of a little bit of discounting, but it's on a whole different level. So what we're teaching salespeople is, how do you, the point is you get delegated to who you talk like. We worked with a, a cleaning company that goes in and, and literally cleans institutions like this and, and, and outpatient clinics and stuff like that. And their call used to be, hi, we're from such and such cleaning. We'd like to come measure your facility and see if we can do better than your current cleaner. I mean, that was literally their pitch because they thought if I could just get in the door, I could knock a, po a point or two off of that and I could win the business. Now they call up saying, hey, we're from such and such cleaner. We'd like to know how confident you are that your after hours cleaning service is contributing or, um, I don't remember the exact words, is, is helping you keep your office healthy and safe for your employees and customers. And they're like, what the heck? <laughs> you get another few minutes with that call, right? And we have a whole dialogue about the types of cleaning util uh, utilities they use, the types of microfiber versus cotton, um, uh, all these different things that, and, and statistics to back up why they clean, they provide a healthier clean. And what happened is they went from talking to the custodial services up to the facilities manager because you get delegated to who you talk like. 
If you catch a facility manager on the phone and you say, I'd like to measure you up and see how much it costs, you get delegated to the custodial services, more or less procurement. If you talk like this person, you stay there. And every day we're trying to help companies talk like the person you want to engage with. Increase the intellectual altitude of your story and connect with the things that they will care about and the things that they will connect to. And um, that changes the game. Procurement will show up, but it's harder to unwind. Yes? Yeah, look at my fingers, too. I, was, I might not get through security. <laughs> so because it's our style, you'll notice that any video we create uh, might not have a speaker on it, but we use sort of whiteboard style imagery. But um, I think this is why uh, uh, infographics are becoming so popular and powerful, because infographics aren't metaphorical images. They're visualizations of stories and, and visualization of data to help tell a story to make it more memorable. So I still believe, because the part of the brain we're trying to aim at is very simple, simple concrete imagery, whatever the environment is. But it doesn't have to be scribbles, but it does have to be simple and concrete. If you spice it up with a little bit of metaphorical, fine. But don't rely on the metaphorical. I just did a webcast with a guy who used, everybody uses that darn goldfish jumping out of the bowl. <laughs> right? You know what you want to see? You even know what I'm talking about. And he put that thing up. And I'm like, really? Is anybody in the room going, oh, thank God. <laughs> now I get it. Everybody went home and ripped it out of their presentation because there's nothing original about it. And he was trying to talk about differentiation. People can't do anything with that. And his words were maybe smart. But you didn't hear the words. You kept saying, there's a damn goldfish jumping out of a bowl again. This guy's got to get more stock photography. So this is the challenge I think you're dealing with is, is we're inundated with that stuff. And people, how can you keep them from tuning out? And there's sort of a freshness about a really minimalistic sort of approach that just clearly expresses what you're asking them to do because you're appealing to a decision-making part of the brain that is not abstract or complicated. It abhors abstraction and complications. It loves simple and concrete. So I would say find a way to make sure that whatever medium you're using um, is visual and then use a simple concrete visuals. Yes? Especially in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. The question is harder over the web and stuff like that. So when I do webcast, I have these all in, in PowerPoint, but as animated builds. So as I'm talking, I'm clicking, and it looks like it's formulating and drawing. So they're having the same experience you're having uh, because it's dynamic and uncertain. Um, but uh, so I'm not saying PowerPoint is bad. We just use it badly. Um, but yes, go ahead. Oh, shit. <laughs> I should know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, right, right. <laughs> it does. Right. Yeah. Ab well, everybody can do it if they're willing to practice, right? So I have a daughter who's in college, and she's a senior. She's a marketing psychology major. Yeah. But I asked her to intern this summer, and she said, I will not work for you. <laughs> I'm like, what? And, um, and, and uh, she just texted me recently. They had to give a sales pitch in their marketing class, and then they had to vote on the best one. And she texted me. She goes, I won in a landslide. And I wrote back, must be the DNA. <laughs> then she wrote back, or the 50,000 times I practiced it. Now, my daughter's a collegiate gymnast. She gets this. She practices 27 hours a week, six days a week, 46 weeks out of the year for events that last a minute and a half. Way more practice than actual delivery in front of anybody. So when she said she practiced 50,000 times, it probably wasn't that many, but it was a lot. We don't get the idea of practice anymore. We just think, hey, I've got to be able to do this thing. 
so that's I would I can't, that's all I can tell you is it takes some practice. They're using all the formats like uh, I recently was in New York at a deli with a client of mine from India. So that was just surreal, right? I'm from Milwaukee, so I'm in New York in a deli with a client from India. And we're talking to each other and I had to show him a picture so I just turned my portfolio around and I drew the picture. Now I've gotten good enough, I can draw these upside down and write upside down, not everybody can do that. You know, that's a trained professional. Um, <laughs> and, and so I drew this and told him this story and he got out his phone and was gonna take a picture of it. Now mind you, this is a client, so he should understand what I'm doing to him. And so I tore it off and I gave it to him. I said, no, this is the way this works. So what you draw has to be drawable on any surface, any size. So it can't be too complicated. You have to be able to communicate it if you have a notepad, if you have a whiteboard, if you have a flip chart, whatever the surface might be, if it's a napkin, right? you have to be able to tell the story. So the stories have to be simple and concrete enough and retellable. Because you also want that person to go retell it. Now I imagine, what if I had bullet points on a slide and he went back to India to tell them what I had told them, as opposed to having this visual now, he could retell that whole story. You could tell this story. You can draw and tell the hammock story tomorrow. If I had put up the bullet points, you would totally forget we even talked about it. So that's where you're aiming for. Any surface is possible, and in fact, many of your sales conversations don't allow you to set up PowerPoints. There's just not an environment for it. United Rentals is one of our biggest clients, and they have steel toe boots, and they go to construction trailers on job sites, and they do this on their clipboards. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean a lot of technical people use visuals, highly complicated, difficult visuals, but they can all be simplified. So I think the stats I just saw recently is we don't have visual learners and auditory learners. We are all visual learners. Like 92% of people's preferred learning method is visual. So even these engineers and technical people are visual learners. And somehow you're going to probably have to actually just start demonstrating it and having them react to it. It's how I do it to salespeople. Because there's a lot of salespeople who say, I am not going to do drawing. You know? They go, you know, my name is Simon. And I love to do drawings. And I, I'm like, and, there, and then, what happens is, though, uh, I'll have a conversation with them doing it, and then they realize at the end, I'm like, you know how engaged you are here? This is, isn't this what you want to do to your customers? In fact, I do this little test. I'm going to do this for you right now. It's my hot close, and I'm probably a little bit out of time. So I'll do my hot close based on that question. Here's what I say to my salespeople, and most of our salespeople, Oracle is our biggest client. These are highly technical people as well that we help serve and do this with. But I'll tell you from people going to construction sites to people selling high-tech software, this is working. And I say, okay, as a salesperson, and you're in front of a customer, you want to be memorable, even remarkable, don't you? You want to kill it. And in fact, you want to be really different from everybody else they see. Here's a clicker, here's a marker. Which one is going to make you different, stand out, memorable, remarkable? Of course, this is after they've at least seen one, right? And get them thinking. The second thing I say is, your goal in this meeting is to be consultative. You want to be a trusted advisor, right? I mean, who just wants to be transactional? You want to add some value, don't you? Well, which one feels like, do you think, to the other person on the side of you, on the opposite side, that you are a consultant, you are a trusted advisor, you know your stuff, you are credible? Tell me, which one feels more like that? This is the part where they got, I got stunned silence in the room, right? So inside baseball, this is supposed to work this way. The third thing is that you want to, um, you want to sell solutions, right? It's all about, well, let's sell solutions that are based on client problems. I, I want to be a solution seller, not a product peddler. 
And if anybody's in their company saying, you know what we need to do more of in our, pro our company is be more of a product peddler. But everybody's saying, I want to be a solution seller. Well, if you get in a room, you're trying to sell solutions, craft solutions, develop solutions, not be seen as a product peddler, which one feels more like a solution provider versus a product peddler? So now tomorrow when you go out and you want to be remarkable, different, memorable, engaging, interactive, trusted, credible, solutions oriented, all those things that you want to be and the company wants you to be, what are you going to do? And I allow that to just sink in for a second to just help them see that maybe there's a better way. And it's usually on the heels of having drawn something a little bit memorable and allowing them to agree that that's pretty useful. And I just let them do this little contrasting scenario in their heads in terms of who they want to be and deciding which one. I'm not even saying which one's right. I'm not even asking them to say. I'm letting them self-persuade. On average, when we train salespeople, we find that about 65% of them will use these techniques 75% or more of the time. They're called the high adopters. The other 35% are called low adopters. And what we've got is over two years of doing third-party data on this, high adopters will outperform low adopters in terms of improving the size of deals. Their, si deal, their deal size goes up two to th three times greater than low adopters. Their ability to achieve their quota goes up three to four times greater than low adopters. And that's the justification and validation we usually come back to companies with and say, why are you still a low adopter? So let's talk about this. So I would just tell you that it's through additional story, maybe some props, some other ways that you've got to help them see that. And you literally have to help them see it. You have to walk it first. You've got you to almost bring them, you've got to have them trying it on as they experience you doing it to them. So that's, that's a, a bit of a longer answer, but that's one way to do it, I would say. So, in sort of summary, though, because I've got to go, you've got to go. I've got a plane where, to go back where it's colder. Did I mention it's great to be here? Uh, but I do want to leave you with this one last thought. Is anybody familiar with a man named Malcolm Gladwell? All right, well, you love Malcolm Gladwell. Yesterday, uh, a third of the audience was from outside the United States. They weren't as aware of Malcolm Gladwell, I, just, I found out. Malcolm Gladwell's very first book, the one that made him famous, was The Tipping Point one of my favorite books. It catapulted him, ironically it was the tipping point to his career. It catapulted him to the stratosphere in terms of authors. He made millions of dollars on this book. He now charges $150,000 for an hour like I just gave you. I don't think your lunch fee would have covered him. And I don't think your budget would have covered him. But what nobody knows, or very few people know, is if you look at a small, small, small footnote inside of the tipping point, you realize that Malcolm Gladwell did not invent the concept, the tipping point. He didn't even name it the tipping point. A political scientist out of Chicago did the original research, published, and named it the tipping point 40 years before Malcolm Gladwell's book. You look it up, Morton Grodzins, 40 years before this book, he was the father of the tipping point. Yet he died, he toiled and died in ap academic obscurity. Nobody knows Morton Grodzins. I challenge you, go Google Morton Grodzins and see if his picture comes up. I recently challenged somebody that and they said, I Googled Morton Grodzins and your picture showed up. <laughs> I've told this story so often, I don't know if it still does because I don't go do that for myself, but somebody told me that your picture shows up. That's how obscure this poor sap is, right? Yet he had a 40-year head start with an innovative idea that the world would spend millions of dollars for, but Malcolm Gladwell capitalized on that. Now Malcolm Gladwell, six books deep, he just wrote David and Goliath. He's ripping off God. <laughs> you get a little bit of hubris when you're as big as Malcolm Gladwell, but what made the difference? Every, both of them had the same exact product. When you don't have the most innovative product or people can't tell your product apart, you can still win, even if you didn't invent that product. I would challenge you by this and tell you that Gladwell told a better story. He messaged it great. He made an old topic that nobody even knew about fresh. He made it a, a, applicable. He, he brought it to life, and the dollar-spending public ate it up. He told a better story, he messaged it great. My goal today was to give you some messaging and story tips and techniques 
and my goal for you leaving here is tomorrow, you will be Gladwell, not Grodzins. Thank you. <laughs>